Okay, then you open the catalog on known black holes and you find out there are just two that fit your gold. One is M87 star, the other one is Sagittarius A star. They are very different in masses, about a thousand times different, but M87 is bigger but farther away, Sagittarius A star is smaller but closer to us, so roughly they appear with the same size, of the order of 50 micro arc seconds. There are two more candidates, um, these two guys over here, but they are at least a factor two smaller. So for the very near future, these are the best guys we have in order to image. And that's what we have actually imaged. Now let's take M87. Um, this is an elliptical galaxy in the Virgo cluster. Um, we know that there, is a, there was uh, a mass of about a few billions of solar masses. If you look at the, the optical, it doesn't tell you anything in particular. You just see that there is a little filament coming out. We know that's a super um, uh, energetic jet of plasma. If you look at it in the radio, then you realize that this object is actually much bigger. Um, this is uh, an observation you can do with uh, a few centimeter wavelengths. You can uh, try and zoom in uh, with the radio by increasing the, the, the frequency or decreasing the wavelength of observation. And, and this is something that radio astronomers have learned to do very, very well over the last 50 years. So, you know, you can look at a picture of the interior of M87. You see now very clearly there is something coming out in the form of a jet. You can take a zoom of the inner part. You do this by going to higher frequencies. You can take a zoom of the inner part of the inner part. And... Just to give you an idea, this is the resolution we have reached with uh, the Event Horizon Telescope. So it's a factor 10 at least larger than anything was obtained before. And, and that's because this, this object, as I was mentioning, is extremely compact. Now, how do you reach such a, a ridiculously high resolution? Well, there is this technique. As I said, it's, it's an old technique. We just use it to the extreme. And it's called VLBI, or Very Long Baseline Interferometry. And this technique is based on a very simple algebraic expression that tells you that if you want a given resolution, then this is given by the ratio between the wavelength at which you're making your measurement and the size of the telescope. Actually, this is true for any astronomical observation. Okay, so you want this number to be as small as possible. And uh, if you are naive, the first thing you say, okay, I'll take the smallest wavelength I can get, X-rays or gamma rays, right? then I can get away from, with a small telescope. Problem is, all of that radiation doesn't reach you. It is, it is blocked before it reaches us. It is produced near a black hole, but doesn't reach you. The only radiation that reaches you and is not then also scattered is radio. So at the, at the numerator here, you want 1.3 millimeters because that light will just reach us after some million years. Okay, then if you want micro arc second here, you need uh, something which is of the order of the whole planet. And so that's the idea of the Event Horizon Telescope, to create a virtual radio telescope, which is as big as the Earth. And this technique uh, is then works like so. You take a few telescopes, 30, 50 meter telescope, nothing particularly large, and you put them together. So for instance, you take uh, a telescope uh, in Arizona and one in the Hawaii, and you put them into an interferometric observation mode. And in this way, you essentially have a telescope which is as large as the distance between Arizona and the Hawaii, which is roughly two and a half thousand kilometers. Now, if you think a little bit about this, there is something strange going on, right? How, how does this work? It is very important that you measure exactly the same wavefront. And that is why these telescopes, but every other telescope as well, is equipped not only with a very high sensitive receiver that measures the electric field of the electromagnetic wave or the radio wave, but also an atomic clock. With the atomic clock, you take note of when the wavefront reaches you, and then you can align all the different signals. And this, you know, given the, the proper time delay between, you know, the, the curvature of the Earth and so on and so forth, allows you to make sure that you're really observing the same wavefront and therefore to do interferometry. You know, taking a photo of one and, and, and two different telescopes is not sufficient. You really have to make simultaneous and well, by nanosecond precision observations. 
Now, why do, why do you need more than two? Deformity just needs two, right? Well, the trick is that every time you have a different distance between two telescopes, you have a different telescope size. So you can think that actually by having many telescopes, it's like patching together pieces of a big telescope. Another advantage is that the Earth rotates. This means that at one point, say the telescopes here in France, Noema, or in Spain, Pico Veleta, will stop seeing the source. But if there are other telescopes in, in, in Chile, for instance, they can start picking up the signal. And so you have essentially a long integration time of about 10 hours, eight, 10 hours, over which you can observe the same source. And these are extremely weak sources. So you really need to integrate for a long time. So this is in a nutshell, the LBI. Um, so you can think that these are the telescope. Each telescope has a certain baseline of a given color. These produce a track in the UV uh, what we call the UV plane. Essentially, you imagine you have the intensity of, of the light, this I, as a function of the projected coordinates in the sky, and you're taking a Fourier transform in, in two dimensions. And out of this Fourier transform, which is a complex quantity, you obtain uh, an image. You can build out an image. And in principle, you would like all of this space to be filled, just like in a power spectral density, you would like the whole range of, of frequency from zero to infinity to be filled. Here you would like all of this space to be filled with tracks. If time goes on, the tracks become you know, more longer and you can have, of course, different separation, different sizes, and so you will get different details of the image. And so this is the way VLBI. At the beginning, you have very little information when you have just two telescopes, but then as you start putting in and populating this space, this Fourier space, you get more and more data, you can build a finer and finer uh, image, okay? And that's what we have done, essentially. Now, in 2017, um, we took the, uh, the, the, the data, it took two, two years to analyze the data, and in 2019, in April 2019, we published this data for M87, okay? So this was observed for eight days, but four days were good, okay? Not, not when you have such uh, a complex setup, it can happen that one telescope doesn't work or there is bad weather in another telescope, so your network is not perfect. Um, in fact, you, know, you need a lot of luck because you're given just a few days to make the observation. If you get bad weather everywhere, you're screwed. You have to go to the next year because this happened just once a year. But in 2017, we were lucky, so we got these very nice images. You can see that the images are not identical. They, they, they are similar, but not identical. And that's because the time scale here of the order of days. This is an important point. I'll get back to it later on. So um, people, my colleagues gave me this data and they, they essentially said, okay, make sense of this. What are we seeing here? And this is where the theory work starts and this is where uh, my work started. So if you want to do theory of this image, essentially you need three steps. The first one is performing simulations in general relativistic magneto aerodynamics, okay? Um, and impossibly in an arbitrary space times. This allows you to understand what happens to the plasma when it falls onto the black hole. The second one is given a, a distribution of matter, understand how light is produced by this matter and how light is propagated into the space time, which is not trivial. And then of course, comparison with the observations. And we were particularly lucky, actually I think, you know, with, with a bit of pride, the ERC Synergy Ground Black Hole Cam is, um, gave me and my colleagues a lot of money. And this triggered a similar investment from the US side. And at that point, we had enough people in the EHT to actually make it work. And the real you know, heroes of this story are these guys here who really uh, worked hard with me in Frankfurt. They are all now all over uh, in, in uh, permanent positions in Japan or in China or in, uh, in, in the UK or uh, Netherlands. I tend to think about, about a problem in terms of the equations I have to solve. Um, so these are the equations I have to solve. Um, these are the equations of magneto aerodynamics, essentially they are conservation laws. And this is what they, you know, as I explained, tell me about the dynamics of matter. 
And, and then I need this additional radiative transfer equation, which tells me how a given parcel of photons will be absorbed or scattered uh, or emitted as it moves on a geodesic in a given space time. So uh, I need to do general relativistic radiative transfer. It's, the radiative transfer comes from this conservation, which is a Boltzmann equation, essentially, for the intensity. And I need to take into account that I'm going in a very funny trajectory in a, in a curved space time. So to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, let's suppose you want to study accretion onto a curved black hole, rapidly spinning, 0.94. Um, what you do is you solve the equations already of, uh, of relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. dynamics. This is a, a, a torus of plasma that is accreting onto a black hole. Uh, in red and, and, and yellow, you see density of the plasma. And in blue, you, you see what we call the magnetization, is the strength of the magnetic field. And what you can appreciate is that, well, first of all, the, the, the accretion is not on a flat disk, it's actually on a thick disk. And what you can also appreciate is because the, there is an instability which is leading to the uh, accretion process, this is a chaotic problem. So the amount of matter that falls onto a black hole is not steady. It's a bit like when you are near to a waterfall. Water will come, will fall roughly at a, at, a, at a given rate, but there's going to be times when it falls more and less. This is roughly the inclination at which we think we're seeing M87. And now you have to imagine that you go and put on glasses that allow you to see in the radio. Okay, so now we go from plasma dynamics to light dynamics. This is the light that you would see. Because inclination is so small, you essentially see a ring of light. Um, there is this part which is slightly brighter, but this is deceptive. It's like so because we are in a very special orientation. If you were to rotate this uh, the, you know, radiation field, you will see that it looks very funny, and I'll try to explain why. And of course, this is the way a telescope would see that very image. That was the image produced by a simulation then with radiative transfer, but this is the way a, an actual EHT set of telescope would see the image. Now, why uh, do we do or do we need to do radiative transfer? Everybody knows how a pointer, a laser pointer works, right? I press a button, a laser beam is produced. This hits the, the screen and, and makes up a, a green point. The reason why I know how to use this without solving any equation is because we are in a locally flat space time. Everything is propagating on a straight line. So it's trivial, okay? I just point, I know it's gonna end up there. But if I were in a curved space time, light can go all over the place depending on where it is, where the, 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 the curvature is and how the light is oriented. To give you a better idea, imagine you have a black hole and you have a, a, a thin disk of matter, you know, a luminous disk of matter, and you wanna take a photo at a given inclination. You will first get all the photons you know, that are directly emitted in a straight line towards you. So you would see the first part of the disk. It's like you seeing, you know, the front part of my shirt. But we also see the, the part which is behind the black hole. This is the back part because these photons, instead of going straight up, they're actually bent. And if you, to make things even more interesting, you can see even photons that will come all the way. And, and so this part here, is the lower sheet of this luminous disk. If you ever have seen interstellar, you have seen this image, right? So now you understand why this image looks like so. It's a thin disk of light. It's, it's, it's a, almost correct. It's not quite correct. It has a number of flaws, but it's a very good approximation. And what this tells you is that if you have to hide, don't go behind a black hole. It doesn't help. Now, as I said, uh, the disk is not thin, but uh, thick. And you know, so that's the kind of picture you have to imagine. Now, if you just rotate this object, you will appreciate something important. Um, first of all, you see these black regions here, which we call the shadow. Then there is going to be, if you see it exactly from the top, it's gonna to be a, a uniformly bright ring. But if you don't do that, and any other inclination, there's always going to be a bright side. That's because there is a Doppler effect that boosts light coming, uh, emitted from this region, and comes towards you. 
So in general, you would expect that there are there is always a bright, you know, spot or part of any black hole image, unless you're seeing it in a very special orientation. These dark regions are very important. We call them the shadow. It's got nothing to do, well, not, nothing to do, but it's not the event horizon. The event horizon, you cannot image because by definition it's a null surface, you cannot receive light from that. So to understand the difference between black hole horizon, event horizon, and a shadow, again, let's take a black hole. Let's put it in front of a source of light. What is gonna happen is that this source of light will send photons. There's going to be photons that come straight and end into the black hole. But there are going, going to be photons that come close enough to the black hole that will be intercepted and eventually will fall into a black hole. That's because there is a, a surface which is called the light sphere, such that all photon orbits inside this are unstable and will end up into the black hole. So now, if you are a, an observer here, what you will see is the envelope of all the light that is absorbed by the black hole, either because there is light going into the event horizon or because there is light that eventually goes into the event horizon. The sizes are important. The event horizon in non-rotating is 2m. The photon orbit is uh, 3m. And the shadow, which is essentially the impact parameter because it's the infinity projected surface is square root of 27, which is roughly 1, 5.2. So what we measure is actually this object over here, which is proportional to the mass and is an, an indication, a very strong indication of the presence of an event horizon. You can have objects that have a, a light ring but do not have an, an horizon. So it's not, a, a, you know, it's not a proof. Another thing you have to appreciate is that if you emit a photon here, this will certainly end up in the black hole. But if you emit a photon here towards the observer, this photon will have no problem reaching you. That is why this region is not completely black. There's still some light that can be produced anywhere between the black hole and you inside the shadow and will reach you. So normally we measure the increase or decrease rather of intensity in the shadow as a measurement. But don't ever expect to see a dark, completely dark image. Okay, so what are the spaces of parameters? When, you know, we had to explain what were those images. We had to change the black hole mass and spin, uh, consider black holes in different theories of gravity, or maybe alternatives to black holes. These are uh, compact objects which are either without horizon and have either or not a surface. There is a whole zoology of possible objects that are called black hole mimickers because they behave almost as black holes, but they are not black holes. Then there is the plasma dynamics. Of course, we don't know what are the, you know, the physical properties near a black hole. What, are, what is the importance of magnetic fields? And depending on what is the importance of magnetic fields, we know that there are at least two bimodal ways of accretion. One is called the SANE or standard accretion, and the other one is called the MAD or magnetic, magnetically arrested. We don't know which is the right one, so we have to perform simulations of either scenario. And, and here comes the most important and delicate part. We don't know exactly the microphysics of the emission. We know it has to come from uh, you know, electrons, and, but we don't know much more, and I'll explain this in the detail. And then, of course, we don't know the orientation. We have no idea how the, the black hole is oriented, how the disk is oriented. So we have to do all possible choices. So the electron thermodynamics is an important point I want to discuss with you. <clears throat> so we are receiving light at 1.3. That means it has to be produced by synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron radiation is produced by free electrons going around magnetic field lines. It's essential to know what is the energy distribution of these electrons, which we don't know, because our simulation, the, the magnetodynamic simulations, tell us about the ions, um, you know, the inertial part of the fluid. So, you know, how you go from the temperature distribution of the ions to the energy distribution of the electrons. There are many ways of doing this. The first thing is you say, okay, let's assume that the distribution is thermal. This is not necessarily correct, but you can, you know, once you have a temperature, then you have an energy distribution very easily. 
And then you can say, okay, the temperature of the electrons is related to the temperature of the ions through some expression, which is you know, as simple as possible. So um, Ti is what we compute, Te is what we need in order to get the light. And this is the relation we normally use. Um, beta is the plasma. Beta is just the ratio between gas and magnetic pressure. And then you have this additional coefficient here, which allows you to essentially put a lot of cold or hot electrons in different parts of the, of the fluid. So the beta distributes uh, electrons either in the jet or in the disk. And this um, allows you to play around with how many electrons or hot electrons you have. So this is a phenomenological expression. Um, and we tried uh, different values of these are high, and essentially we go from one to uh, 160. And we have no idea and, uh, which one is the right one. What is interesting is that later on, we have carried out more sophisticated uh, microphysics um, motivated expressions uh, for the energy distribution of the electrons, you know, either coming from turbulent heating or magnetic reconnection. And at the end of the day, you know, this guy is a very simple generic formula that covers all the relevant aspects. So if you're ignorant, this is a good way to go. And of course, we don't know exactly what's going on. Okay, so we had to do a lot of simulations. About half of the simulations were carried out in Frankfurt in Germany. Out of these simulations, you build scenarios by playing around with where you put the electrons and, and the, the energy of the electrons, and you build up a, a library like so. This is just a few of the many simulations we carried out. And you can see, maybe not very much, um, that there are you know, situations where the shadow is very small. We're looking all of them from the top, where the shadow is very small, where the shadow is very large, when the disk goes in one direction or in the other direction, this is the, action, the spin that is moving in different directions. So out of this, you build <clears throat> images. 60,000 images we built for M87. One important point to understand is that the image is a combination of emissions. Once you have an image like so, it's very difficult to tell where the light is coming from. Again, because of the, the light can come from many different places. And so don't ever ask me, where does the light come from? Because I would not be able. Well, I, I, I can hardly do this in a theoretical image because I've built it, I know everything about it. Let me just be a bit more specific. Suppose that you have these four images. These are coming from, um, these are two MED simulations, these are two SANE simulations, this is R high 160, high 10, so essentially the, the, the possible range. And then you can split this. Um, let's split this into the light that comes from the disk, the light that comes from the jet that comes towards us, and the, the light that, from the jet that comes, that goes away from us. In principle, all of this are decomposed. And then you have a matrix of components like so. And you can see that for this MAD, most of the light comes from the disk. Again, also from this comes from the disk. The near side or the far side jet have very little luminosity. But if you consider saying the largest contribution comes actually from the jet that is moving away from you. So just think about it. There is a jet that is going away from you, and it's this one that produces most of the light in this image. That's a, a, a very large degeneracy in our modeling, and uh, I don't think you can just remove it unless you have other information. So then, as I said, we built 60,000 images, and we have four observed images. So we had to decide which of the theoretical images, which are consistent mathematically and physically, are actually a good description of, of the observation. And for this, we use genetic algorithms or Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques. So essentially, what you have to imagine is that um, you know, a GRMHD simulation, this is a GRMHD simulation which is then deconvolved to reproduce the observation of telescopes, can be split into this Fourier space into closures and visibility amplitudes. And you know, imagine these are the, the, uh, the green dots. And, and the data uh, uh, is instead the blue dots. Those are what we actually have measured. And then you can think that at any time for any simulation, you can build a, 
a, a fit, a chi-squared fit between the data and the actual simulations. And in this way, you can order all of your images, the 60,000 images, you can order them and say, okay, these are the most likely ones. Um, I normally don't get people to understand what I said at this point, so I, I offer an analogy because it's easier to think in terms of images for us than in, in Fourier space. Imagine you are at a stadium. Uh, I don't know what is a stadium here in Barcelona, how many thousand people, but imagine you have a, a stadium with 60,000 people and you have a photo of someone that you want to know if this person is in the stadium. You have a very bad photo. That's all you have. What you can do is you can scan that photo across all the people in the stadium. And the, the software will find matches. And we'll find some matches. And you know this is what the software tells you. I can't tell you whether the person is there. But these are the best matches. And this is already a very good piece of information. Because although you don't have the certainty that that person is there, you already know that this person belongs to this class of people. First of all, they all look like women and they all have long hair. So most likely this object that you have an image of is most likely a woman with long hair, not someone like me. Okay? <laughs> um, and that's pretty much what we've done with M87 and EHT. What we managed to do is set some constraints about what possible object we're looking at. Um, now, this is an example, okay? These are the observations, this is a theoretical model. We know everything about this model, so you may think, okay, you know everything about this. Unfortunately, there is a lot of degeneracy. There are many models very different that give the same match. Just to give you an example, these are three models which give you the same chi-square, so it's like the same class of, of women matching the photo, but one corresponds to a counter-rotating black hole, rapidly counter-rotating, a, a rapidly co-rotating black hole, and, and even a Schwarzschild black hole. And the reason why you get such large variety is because, as I said, we can place electrons where we want. So this is both good and bad. It is good because that tells you, okay, this object must be a black hole because no matter how you play with the spin, you get up the same answer. It's bad because you're blind. You're blind to the spin. You cannot measure the spin yet. Okay, I want to now switch over to, uh, you know, this new object, Sagittarius A star, because a number of things change. All of the microphysics and all of the general relativity doesn't change, but of course there are a few things which are different. So, um, Sagittarius A star was the first object we looked at. We looked at it at the same time as M87. We wanted to look at it first, but then we quickly realized this was a very difficult object to look at. And, and in fact, comes with a number of disadvantages and a few advantages. The first important disadvantage is interstellar scattering. We know that, you know, in M87, just point out of the galaxy, we look at somewhere outside, so we easily get out of all the mess and, and pollution of the interstellar medium. But for the Sagittarius star, you have to go right in the middle of the galaxy, and there is a lot of interstellar material, there is a lot of scattering happening. So if you imagine, you know, this is a, 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 a simulation, and you add the scattering, this is what the simulation does. It creates blurring, it creates, it introduces small scale features. So it, it is much harder to get details. The most important and most severe limitation is the time scale. There is a, a factor of a thousand indifference in the mass, which means that it takes a thousand times less time to go around Sagittarius A star than M87. And the variability is of the order of minutes, while in the case of M87, it was of the order of days. So just imagine of taking a long exposure of eight hours of a subject it is moving on a time scale of minutes. Um, and then the UV coverage, this is what I was mentioning, is not complete. This is the same problem as we had in M87, but it's more severe because of these additional complications, which means that there is a lot of multiplicity in the data. There are many images you can build out of the same data. The error bars are also larger just because of this reason. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's not all that bad. We have some more information. First of all, we know the mass much more accurately. 
uh, in the case of M87, we know it by a factor of two. Here we have a precision of 0.2%. So that's the mass of M80 of Sagittarius A star. Now, 0.2% is equivalent for you to know your weight today with a precision of 100 grams. I don't know how many of you know their weight with a 100 gram precision. I definitely don't. Um, the other thing is that we've been looking at this object for decades. We know very well the radio emission, the infrared emission, the X-ray emission, and we've been looking at the variability while we were taking the, the observations. So all of these things are additional constraints that help us set and clean up a bit more our analysis. So all in all, we have 11 constraints for the simulations. While before we had essentially zero constraints, now we have 11 constraints we have to satisfy. The, the, the shadow has to have the right size, has to have the right emission, the right infrared, uh, you know, at 100, uh, 1.3 millimeter, but also at 86 gigahertz, at two micrometer, and so on, and so on and so forth. Now, um, I had a lot of problem explaining this. So, so, so we were preparing this data, and then we were um, explaining the data to the public outreach officers of the EHT, and they didn't know much of physics. Um, they didn't know anything about VLBI, and they couldn't understand what it actually was. The problem, how can you have many images of the same, on the same um, object? And once you have many images of the same object, how do you convince yourself what is the right image? So I've come up with the following logical equivalent. I don't know how many of you uh, go walking on the mountains uh, in, in Italy, but for those of you who have been to the Dolomites, these are called the Tre Cime di Lavaredo, the Reitzinnen in German. These are three peaks that are very typical of the Dolomites. And this is a time-lapse movie. You can see the rotation of the Earth of a typical November day. I found this on YouTube. Um, so the, you know, the morning starts, uh, sun comes out, cleans up the sky, then, you know, midday, a lot of coverage. Um, then there is the second part of the day, evening, uh, things get cleared up. What you can do is you can take your time-lapse movie and organize it in, into images. And then you can put in one box all the images where you see three peaks. And then you put in another box uh, all the images where you see at least two peaks, doesn't matter which one. And you do the same for another box where you put all of the images where there is at least one, one peak that you see. And in the fourth box, you don't put any, you know, where you never see an image, okay? Because as I explained, sometimes you never see the three peaks. Of course, then you can build an average, which is really the linear superposition of all the images. So this is the, the average of all, the whole day. As you can see, the peaks are clearly visible. The, the sky is you know, always gray because you always have some clouds at any time. And of course, you, you know, would you ever doubt that the mountains are not present here? I guess not. You, know, you would just convince yourself, okay, I don't see the, the mountains just because there is something else that prevents me from seeing it. It's not that they disappear and all of a sudden they appear. Okay? Now, this is pretty similar to what has happened with Sagittarius A star. We have lots of images, 9,000 different images, all compatible with the data. And you can see there are some images which, which have a very nice ring, but other images where there is no ring whatsoever. These are all compatible with the data. And you can do exactly the same, the same logic I've shown you. You can cluster them, and in different clusters, according to where the brightness is, and what is important is the statistics. So there are a few, less than 2% of images, which are compatible with the data, where they, you don't see any ring. And of course, any reasonable person would not say, okay, there is no black hole there, because I know that 2% of the images are not producing a ring. What is important is statistically, 98% of the times, you do get a ring compatible with the data, and that's the average. Now, if you have followed my analogy, I should warn you that there is a loophole in my, in my analogy, and you have to bear in mind. In the time-lapse movie, every image corresponded to a given window in time, okay? You can imagine, whatever, 30 seconds. In the, in the case of the images of Sagittarius A star, they are all compatible with the data. They are all referring to the old eight hours. It's not just 
a snapshot in time. What is relevant in the analogy is really about how you go into clustering the images. So then you can ask, okay, what's the difference between Sagittarius so star and M87 in this framework? Well, essentially it's about the same day on Earth would correspond to you know, a given number of orbits in, in Sagittarius star and a, a fraction of orbits in the case of um, M87. So, you know, essentially we've taken very few images. They are very similar in the case of M87. The statistics in M87 gives you essentially that all of the clusters are the same. Um, and so, you know, again, using uh, the analogy, you can think that in the case of Sagittarius star, you have th this clustering, and in the case of M87, you just have a few. So these are really few of the images that were produced by M87 uh, over the eight hours time uh, span. And of course, the statistics, I, when you compute it, you know, shows you this very difference. And this is a nice image, which brings everything together. Um, so you can see that we've been very lucky that these two objects that I told you are the best candidates that we have actually have roughly the same size. This is, a, this is a realistic description of the sizes. So if you could see in the radio, the 1.3 millimeter, this is what, uh, and you looked in the direction of M87 and, and so you start, that's the, the way they would appear. This guy is slightly bigger uh, than this one. Um, of course, you know, the, the comparison now is far more complicated. I told you that for M87, we had 60,000, and that seemed a lot. For Sagittarius star, we have 1.6 million images. And because we have many different wavelengths, you see, uh, for any simulation, we can get the emission not only at 230 gigahertz, but also at 86 gigahertz, at, uh, this is the 230, and, and in infrared. Okay, so for the same simulation, you had to match many more constraints. Um, this is just giving you an example. Uh, so you take the same black hole and you observe it at different inclinations. And then you can see uh, different spins from the same black hole. This is different spins. This is minus negative. This is positive. And then you can uh, play around with the electron distributions. Just to give you, you know, a pictorial description. So uh, really we have many more intermediate models here. And then you have the two classes of MAD and SAIN. So we have made a lot of simulations, as you can imagine. Three years of simulations, new simulations, 1.6 million of images. And what is it that you add at the end of the day? This is what you get. Well, none of the models matches all the constraints, okay? Or, or just um, if you take away variability, then a, a few models match the constraints what we call the best bet model, so the one that best batches everything, is called uh, a MAD, is prograde, A is positive, actually very high, as a low inclination, uh, I less than 70 degree, and as cool electron, so this corresponds to high 160. On the other hand, they are strongly disfavored, uh, anything which is a single temperature, so high equal one, prograde, negative A, and edge on, so you, you know, the idea that that's, that's how we build the idea that what we see in Sagittarius A star is, again, a black hole whose disk is almost, uh, uh, you know, with a slight orientation with respect to us. How much time do I have, uh, Jorge? Okay. Um, I want you to touch a little bit about gravity. Um, I'll do this quickly. So. Um, you can see here the um, the match between um, um, the, you know the information. You you can you can convert all of this information about the size of the shadow in this parameter delta, which is essentially the deviation away from what you would expect from a, a Schwarzschild black hole. Um, for a Kerr black hole, you would expect this deviation to be uh, in general for negative values, and you can see that essentially both M87 and Sagittarius A star are providing um, you know, very good match. In the case of M87, we have uh, a less variance. And the higher variance in the case of Sagittarius A star is because we have such a precise measurement of the mass that there is very little uh, wiggle room for uh, you know, playing around with, with the, um, 
well, first of all, we also have two slightly different measurements of the mass, and this creates this little uh, variance. And then, um, as I was mentioning, we have so many more constraints to fill that create overall a larger variance. But overall, you can see that everything is consistent with GR. And this is a beautiful uh, plot that shows how black holes, we have seen black holes now essentially across eight orders of magnitude. These are the LIGO black holes, you know, tens of solar masses. This is M87, this is a, a, a Sagittarius A star, and everything, you know, matches the prediction of general relativity. So all observations are consistent with general relativity, but of course, that doesn't mean general relativity is the right explanation. So, um, you know, this is inevitable. If you are dealing with a observational science, a science where you can't build a black hole in the laboratory and check whether it matches your expectation, uh, there's going to be degeneracies. And what you can do is you want to test different theories of gravity. And this is not trivial because there are many, many possible uh, options, hundreds of models. If you open any day of the week the archive on, on gravity, you will find that more than half of the papers are on non-general relativistic predictions of gravity. And so you can, um, you know, if you want to start testing gravity, you can either have an agnostic approach or agnostic approach uh, in order to start singling out some, some uh, alternatives. So I will tell you about an agnostic approach, which is something I worked on a few years back. Um, in the case of imaging, I don't need uh, to solve the Anton's equations. I can invoke the equivalence principle. I, all I need is a space time, the background space time, because the matter that is accreting or the photon uh, are just uh, following simple, uh, mo well, it's not simple, but uh, motions dictated by this metric tensor. So I need a tensor in a given coordinate system. And the idea we had together with Alexander Zhidenko um, is to build a representation where uh, essentially you parameterize your metric in terms of additional coefficients, AI and BI, so that GR becomes just a very special case of this more general description of, of gravity. And um, there are two essential ingredients in this approach, two tricks that really make it uh, powerful. The first one is a, a spatial compactification. We bring in spatial infinity with a proper um, you know, mapping of the coordinates, the radial coordinates. So our coordinate is between zero and one, zero at the horizon, one at infinity. And then near the horizon, where all the metric functions in any coordinate system would diverge, we use a PADE, um, actually a continuous function uh, expansion. And this allows us to essentially capture very, very um, well all of the, of the metric functions. So if you use this <coughs> approach, essentially you can invent any black hole space time you wish, and I can reproduce it numerically by just measuring a few, two, three of these coefficients, A, normally the A, the Bs enter really if you have, uh, if you want to do more than imaging, but three of the A's are sufficient to give you more than, less than 1% precision, okay? Any black hole space time you want. So one way of doing this is, therefore, you make a measurement and you don't say this is a curved black hole or a Schwarzschild black hole. You just say this is a black hole with these values of the parameters. And then, you know, at the end of the day, if these parameters become uh, obviously non-zero, that tells you that there is something, a deviation from general activity. Another approach uh, we also have considered is uh, agnostic. You know, you say, okay, let's have a look at what happens in this very specific black hole space time. Uh, so we looked at dilaton black hole accretion, or we looked at accretion onto a boson star, or we looked at how, given the measurements of the shadow size, how you can set some constraints on charges of black holes. So first of all, uh, what we've done is we consider dilaton black hole. This is essentially a, a black hole where you have two additional fields, a dilaton field, an action field. We consider just the dilaton field. This changes the space time. And we compare all of what I've shown you before, okay, GRMHD, imaging, and so on, but now done on a different space time. And of course, you want to compare apples with apples. So you want to make sure that, you know, given a dilaton black hole, you are measuring, you are comparing a curved black hole that has either 
the same horizon size or the same photon orbit or the same ISCO. Okay, so you can tune these any of these models by just playing around with the dilaton parameter. And um, you know, then you, you carry out simulations. So this is Kerr on the left. This is the dilaton black hole. They have the same ISCO here. Uh, that's why the size of the horizon is slightly different. And you look at these simulations, and if you look at it carefully enough, you see okay, they are they are slightly different. But of course, you know, we 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 we're not going to make simulations, right? We're going to get images, and so what you have to do is to go from here and produce images and see what how different the images are. And this is the image for a Kerr and dilaton black hole, assuming the scattering of Sagittarius A star. You can see that they are slightly different. Okay, um, this one is slightly smaller, but then if you put in you know situations where the scattering really blurs everything, then you you have this. And of course, you know. Even without scattering, these images are so close to each other that the conclusion you can draw is that given the position of the observations, you cannot tell apart black holes of different type. Okay, so you can't distinguish different black holes. That's a reality right now. Another possibility is to look at, well, suppose you have a boson star. And, you know, having a boson star or a very boson condensate a very compact com boson compensate is, is, is a very appealing in on a galactic context, right? You, why not? And so you can do the same. You have to imagine that it is a boson star, so uh, a cloud of bosons, which is much bigger than you know uh, the, the box I'm simulating. But then you have a torus somewhere outside, and then you follow exactly the same uh, simulations that I've shown you before. And, and what you see is that matter will fall. There is no surface. There is no horizon. So matter will fall right in into the very center of the boson star, not right at the center because this object still has some angular momentum, this matter. And so as it gets closer, the angular momentum barrier will prevent it from going to r equals zero. And so what you can see is that essentially a boson star would have like two dark regions. One is you know, the one produced by the ISCO and the other one is produced by the fact there is essentially very little matter at the center. That's not a shadow. It's just no emission because there is no matter. And you can then do again the images. <clears throat> and of course, you see that the case of a boson star, the dark region would be smaller. This becomes very apparent here. And of course, you know, when you know the mass, you, can, you have no freedom on the size of the shadow or of the, of the dark region. And on the basis of this, you know, it is possible to distinguish boson stars from black holes. And in particular, in the case of M87, but also Sagittarius A star, given the simplest uh, models for boson stars, they are incompatible with the observations. And, you know, you can also think about um, looking at charges. These are not electric charges. These are whatever um, property a black hole spacetime can have. So, you know, uh, all of these black holes um, have additional degrees of freedom that it, they can vary between a given range. If you normalize the range between zero and one so that all the curves are, this is, uh, this is the deviation away from a, uh, you know, a Schwarzschild black hole. Um, sorry, this is the deviation of this black hole, whatever it is, um, in terms of its charge, when it, the charge is normalized to so vary between zero and one. And the uh, purple regions, you, you can't quite see, uh, but are two purple regions here and here. These are the ranges where this change is allowed to vary given the observations. Uh, in the case of, you know, uh, zero, is, it's, it's essentially general relativity. And you can see that when these lines cross these boundaries, essentially all of these regions, they are excluded. So right now, most of the black holes um, are, well, all of the black holes are still allowed, as you can see, because there's always a values of the charge where these guys, these curves enter into these objects. But uh, as the observation will become more and more accurate and this range will shrink, you will be able to set more severe constraints on the charges. And that's a, a game that one can play in order to start setting aside a few models or at least restricting the possible values of, uh, of these charges. So I want to conclude. 
I, I try to explain that imaging supermassive black hole is a complex piece of science. Uh, you, you need efforts with different expertise. You need people who know how to use DLBI and collect the data is not trivial. Once you have the data, you have to be able to produce image. Once you have the image, you have to be able to compare it with theory and, and be able to therefore do GRMHD simulations and, and, and understand the gravitational impacts. Over the last few years, we've done so many simulations that essentially we have built more ground, run more ground on understanding accretion processes on, on black holes that, you know, in, in the previous 20 years. We are starting the exploration of, of alternatives to curved black holes. Um, boson stars can be distinguished clearly. Other black holes can, cannot be distinguished. And um, I think EHT has provided the first evidence of supermassive black holes and therefore boosted our understanding of uh, you know, accretion in strong gravity. But if you ask me personally, what is the most important contribution uh, that EHT has done, I think it has transformed the concept, that of the event horizon, from a concept, a mathematical concept, something you teach in your course in general activity, over to a testable object. And this is the first step in the scientific uh, experimental um, you know, progress. The ability to take two theories, check them against the observations, and then conclude whether they are both compatible or both wrong, or one of them is right. So I think this is the most important contribution. Now, we have a way of telling theories apart through observations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Luciano. Thank you, Luciano, for the nice talk. And now it's time for questions. Well, thank you so much for uh, this. Uh, very interesting uh, talk. I have so many questions, but I pick <laughs> only one. So uh, you say that in the case of such a star, uh, there's more variability in the models, if I understand correctly, than what is seen in the images. Yeah. Is that uh, if? What's your view of that? Is that a lack of variability in the mod? Or, or too much variability in the modeling due to the limited number of simulation, although, you know, one no, no, the, the million simulation. is not, it's not the, that. There is something we're missing in, the, in our modeling, theoretical modeling. There is oh. some assumption that is not quite right. And my, you know, if you want my, my guess, is, yes, is I, I, ideal MHD. We're considering ideal MHD as the way to, con the right way of, of modeling these plasmas. But, Maybe it's not ideal emission. Maybe there are resistive effects uh, that you know that will slow down the variability in the flow. Uh, it, you know, the resistivity you can think like some kind of viscosity. The viscosity will bring down the time scales of variability a bit, and maybe we will be able to match the observations. Maybe another you know thing that is a bit. Um, a systematic bias that we have is that we always start with these objects with accretion from a torus. Maybe, you know, that's not the right model. Maybe matter is not really coming up from some uh, equilibrium like that. Maybe there is uh, something different. Uh, that's something we are exploring. But it, yeah, it is telling us that, you know, we don't have a whole picture there. Thanks. So when you say variability, right, you take images that are like integrated in time so you see an integrated effect so it's variability because you compare with say the time order data or no no i think so, yeah. The, which, which, which we... yeah sorry I, I was confusing i was confusing as you as you correctly pointed out the, the image is eight hours so where do i get the variability and from the you know we monitor uh, other wavelengths longer wavelengths like you know 86 gigahertz and there we see the variability. Our simulations can cover both the, the 20 and 30, but also the 86. And it's the 86 that we don't match. We don't go, we can't go, yeah. I mean, theoretically, yes, but we can, there is no way of, of, of telling what was the variability of the actual. Uh, I think. It, it, 
Hi, Lutz. So one, if I remember correctly, one of the things that people are maybe in the future try to measure is this polarization measurement. Yes. Are your codes already prepared for that or are you thinking on extending to measure polarization? So, so <laughs> we already have all the data and, and we have published polarization studies for M87 and we will publish soon also for Sagittarius and Star. Um, unfortunately, you know, they don't, they, the polarization is so small that, that doesn't really break a lot of the degeneracy. But what it's telling you already is that there is a strong poloidal field near the black hole, which is, you know, what you would expect from, um, from the formation of a jet. And the fact that it is so strong seems to indicate that maybe this MAD, this magnetically dominated accretion is the right uh, model. So there are a number of indications that MAD is the right description of the accretion process, but none of this is fair. Yeah, I'm just a little bit curious about the following. So um, you mentioned that you were detecting this 1.3 millimeter radio signal, and um, you're also very concerned about the energy distribution of the electrons. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't something be learned by looking at different wavelengths? Uh, yeah, so, so that's what we do for Sagittarius A star. Uh -huh. Okay, if you remember this, um, this is a very nice representation of, of exactly this point. Oops. So this is the same simulation seen at, uh, at, at this wavelength at 1.3 millimeters, and this is a, a, a longer wavelength. I can't remember how many millimeters this is. And this is the same simulation seen at, at, at two micrometers. So this is the infrared. And we know because we measure, I mean, they have measured in the past how bright is Sagittarius S R in this and how rapidly it changes also during the, the, the time of the observations. And it's this that then we have to match. So when we, you, you have all of these constraints, out of all of those simulations, there are only a few that survive. And that's how you know you have called electrons. Yeah, and that's how we, we think we have called electrons. So a question over there. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. In fact, your first answer gave me some, some ideas about I'm going to talk. First of all, if you are assuming ideal MHD, then uh, you are assuming that the conductivity is infinite, so there is no special turbulence to be considered, magnetoturbulence, for example, and so on. But if it's not infinity, the conductivity, then you it will rise on magnetic reconnection. And if there is some magnetic reconnection with this short scale of times of hours or less than that, they could appear also uh, explosive phenomena like in, in the sun with the flares. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this would be rather short time period uh, phenomena. So are there any possibility in the future to take into account the non, to modify the MHD model to include some of these turbulent convection and so on? Yeah. And second, and my second question is, how how robust are these simulations with uh, with respect to the initial value of the contour condition of the initial magnetic field considered? Because this is also important. Yeah. So you you touched two very important points. Um, ideal MHD. Um, we have resistive runs. Some of the runs, uh, I don't know, maybe one percent of the runs uses resistive. MHD and in those runs we see that the variability is smaller. This is why we think that is the route to go. The reason why we don't normally do this is because resistive runs are at least 10 times as expensive as ideal MHD because you have to solve far more complicated equations in a, in a, in a stiff regime. Um, so we don't have a lot of statistics there. And, and you're right, if you have reconnection, this can lead to flares, these you know, explosive processes uh, which we can then maybe see also in other wavelengths like infrared or x-ray and um, yeah i think the, the that's the way to go we want to increase our understanding of resistive processes now all of our initial configurations are a torus a self non-self-gravitating torus with a poloidal magnetic field of one single polarity then this leads to an instability, which is the magnetorotation instability, creates turbulence, and then you know you lose 
a lot the knowledge of your initial condition, but not all of it. So when you try different initial data, when instead of having a single polarity, you have a, a series of nested loops of polarity, you produce again the magnetic rotation instability, everything becomes turbulent, but there is still some memory. And we see that the dynamics is different. For instance, um, one of the most important things I remember is that in the case of one polarity, the jets explode in both directions. If you have this inversion of polarity, there's going to be inter intermittent jet uh, launching. There's going to be sometimes where you'd see most of the jet from the top, otherwise from the bottom. Uh, sometimes they both, sometimes none of them is there. So there is far more uh, difference in the morphology. Again, this is something that needs uh, investigation, uh, but yeah, it's an important point. Not to mention that, uh, as I was telling to Disha, you know, why start with a torus? Maybe you have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we don't know what, what happens in the uh, supermassive black holes. Maybe you have a very complicated matter distribution that is falling there. Maybe, you know, there are stellar winds which are channeled in something that doesn't look like a torus at all. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask about this uh, inclination angle. Well, basically, I see that you're uh, able to tell very little from those images. You, you can say it's not edge on, but you have this very, well, just inclination less than 70 degrees. And I was wondering, you know, there's also these observations from the gravity instrument in the VLT telescopes, where they also get, you know, not mm -hmm. as close as you, but they get close to the, I mean, I think 20, 20 times the... No, no, it's a thousand, ta thousand charge ah, radii. A thousand charge radii. But so they are basically able to see some kind of flare and uh, yeah. their motion in the disk. So can they tell from this something about this inclination angle? And could you use this information? That, that's what they claim. They claim they, you know, because they have seen something that behaves like a normal circular or orbit, that they think we are seeing uh, Sagittarius a star almost face on, which is our best bed model is 30 degree uh, inclination. So both, you know, let's say that our conclusions match in this respect. Okay. Now, one thing that disturbs me about this result is that if you think about M87 and Sagittarius A star, we are looking at both of them with roughly the same inclination. We have two black holes, roughly the same inclination. <laughs> Close to zero, yeah. On the other hand, you know, let's be physicists. This is small statistics we may just be fooled by the small statistics. And uh, besides, just wait 100 million years, they will have a different, we will be in a different position. So they will look different. About the alternative theories, you consider a theory with uh, charges and you mentioned that these are not electric charges. Are they U1 charges? What is the model? You know, essentially, there are deviations. You can uh, imagine Schwarzschild, the Schwarzschild solution. In, uh, next to the mass, you introduce another quantity, uh, which could be, you know, any, can be a, a scalar field or something else. Um, and, and then you check what is, and this, of course, will produce different space-time uh, metrics. And you can ask yourself, okay, then how does the shadow size change when I vary these additional parameters. These are not solutions of the Ansen's equations, okay? Yeah, but yeah. Are, uh, the alternative theories you consider, aren't they uh, excluded for other reasons? For no, example, of course not. Well, the dilaton, you don't have extra massless uh, fields, no? I don't think it's, it's excluded uh, at all. Actually, it's one of the, uh, you know, string theories like that at most. But no, the, in string theory, you must have a mass, the dilaton. So this is a string-inspired black hole which produces this uh, dilaton field or action field, but we don't know what are the properties or the masses of this field. I don't think you, you know, we have any, any measurement that can, can exclude even scalar fields, masses. Massless scalar fields? Yeah. Well, I don't know. <clears throat> so let's make one last question. Yeah. A very naive question. You were stating that in the case of M87, a significant part of the light was coming from the counter jet, actually. No, no, no. That's not what I said. Uh -huh. I said that I don't know where the light comes from. And I've given you an example where the image is dominated by the counter jet. Okay. So in M87, I have just an image. 
and I can't tell you where how that image is built. Okay, but, but the jet can can enter the game. Emission from the jet, light from yes. the jet. But in Sagittarius A star, we don't have a jet. We don't see a jet, no. So the question is, are your simulations providing information constraints on the jet formation process itself? So yes and no. I mean, and the um, first of all, our images are very close to the black hole. Okay, and maybe the jet is transparent at these frequencies on these scales. Maybe you will start seeing the jet as you go to larger distances at much uh, smaller wavelengths. So the reason we don't see a jet neither in Sagittarius A star nor in M87 doesn't mean there is no jet. In fact, in M87, we know there is a jet. It's just that we don't see it near the black hole. Um, we can tell, you know, by matching this MAD, we can tell that there's going to be a strong uh, magnetic field near the black hole. Um, and the jets produced by MAD simulation tend to have certain morphology, which is different from saying they tend to be wider. So that's all the input that you can get on the, on the, pre, on the presence of, of a jet in M87. Now, if you, if you ask yourself, which is a question I ask myself, why don't I see a jet in Sagittarius A star? And well, you know, first of all, good we don't see because we would be probably <laughs> wiped out by the radiation of it. But the accretion rate is very important. It's one million times smaller. So it's like, you know, Niagara Falls versus a dripping tap. Uh, our black hole increases one solar mass in 100 million years. Is it really on a diet? While, uh, you know, M87 is having a good lunch. Uh, okay, so I guess this is the right moment to have <laughs> lunch. <laughs> so let's thank Luciano again for the question. I, I, remind the, I remind the PhD students that want to talk to the channel that he will be available for discussion at 3.45 in the blue room.